Hello, I'm Leonard Maltin. Star Wars may have started out as a mere movie, but it became a phenomenon. It changed the way movies were made and perceived and marketed. It ushered in a new era of science fiction and fantasy and developed a whole new vocabulary of visual special effects. And the man who created the film, who imagined it and then realized it, is here with us today to share some of his memories, George Lucas. George, if I asked you to sum up your feelings today, looking back at the whole Star Wars experience, if I asked you to sum that up in one word, what word first comes to mind? If there's anything the Star Wars experience has been for me, it's unpredictable. You know, not only in the making of the movies and, and in creating the stories in the first place, which is the fun of it, is because you don't know where it's going to go, and the making of them were a huge adventure. But um, the success and all the stuff that's come after it and everything is just, you know, you have no idea what's going to happen next. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. What was the beginning? I would say probably the original impetus for the whole thing was I used to watch a, a, a serial on television called Adventure Theater, and they had uh, Flash Gordon, Conquest of the Universe on it, and I used to love that. So I went off and wrote my own space opera uh, and um, developed the story and took it to... Um, United Artists that had the first rights to it. They said no, they didn't want it. And then I took it to Universal because I just finished American Graffiti and they said no, they didn't want it. And uh, finally took it to 20th Century Fox and uh, Al Knight Jr. said, I'm interested. He said, I don't understand this, but I loved American Graffiti and whatever you do is okay with me. Because otherwise I don't think it would have ever gotten done. Because it was crazy. You know, you know, spaceships and Wookiees and robots and it was just unlike anything that had ever been seen before. Tell me about that first script. Now, did you try to tell the whole story in one script? Well, at that point, it wasn't the whole story. I, was, I wrote a script, and the script was um, very ambitious. It told a very large story. Um, and um, when I finished it, I realized that it was way too big to make into a movie. So I took the first part of it, sort of the first act, and I said, I'll make the movie about this. And I had to expand on it and move it around, play with it a little bit. But I basically then focused on that as being the film. And I said, someday, if I ever get a chance, maybe I'll make these other things, the rest of it, the other two-thirds into a movie. But right now, that's just going to have to go on the shelf, and I'll leave it there. And uh, so that's really how the first project came to pass. The other part of it is, is in order to write that first script, I had to write a backstory about where Darth Vader came from, uh, how the kids evolved, you know, his wife, uh, how, how Ben related to all that, how the Emperor came to power. And that ended up being the basis for the projects that I'm working on now. You have a go-ahead on the script. You're revising it as you're preparing now to shoot the movie. How do you begin to prepare to shoot this movie? I went around and there were no departments at the studios, no one to do this. So I had to sort of build up from scratch my own special effects company in the process of starting this whole thing. How do you find people? How do you find the right people to do that kind of thing and to invent things, which is what they had to do? Yeah, there was a small group of people that had done special effects. Uh, some guys had worked in commercials doing the Pillsbury Doughboy and this, you know, so there, you know, there was maybe a few dozen people in Hollywood that had actually had some experience. They were mostly college students. They are mostly very young. Um, I think the average age of ILM when it started was like 24. That's the average age, and so there were a lot of kids that were like 19, 20 years old. Tell me about some of the casting decisions. What I would do is I would take the various contenders for the various roles, and I'd mix them around and have them work ensemble. Because what I was trying to do is see how they all look together and work together as a group, not as individuals. Uh, and I think that was a very important part about the casting is that I cast a group. I didn't cast one person, one person, one person. I, I saw how they all worked together and then chose it that way. What was the most serendipitous bit of casting? Probably uh, Harrison. Uh, Fred Roos, who was helping with my casting, was a good friend of Harrison's. And, and um, so he, he had had him, he was a carpenter, and he sort of had him, I mean, he'd been an actor and he'd been under contract, but he was working as a carpenter, fixing their offices up. And as I was casting everybody, um, we said, well, let's, you know, we'll start doing these tests. And I said, well, you know, we're short one hand solo. You know, I, I've only found four. I need five because I have five of everything else. And, um, and so I just said, well, 
Harrison, do you want to do this? You want to stand and sort of read some parts against these other parts so we can get through this thing? And he said, yeah, and he started reading and he read them better than anybody else did. What was the toughest part of making Star Wars? Well, there was a lot of drama through the whole thing. It was a very tough film to make. It was a, it was a, a fairly low-budget film. You know, it was a $10 million movie uh, at a time when most movies were, the big-time movies were $20, $30 million. How much of that went to effects? Well, about $2 million went to effects. There weren't very many effects. And, and I think the toughest part was when I finished shooting, I came back to the United States, I had no editor, I had to reassemble the entire movie of what had been cut, start from scratch. I went down to ILM, and they'd spent a million out of the $2 million. Uh, we were about five months away from release of the movie, and they didn't have any shots done. And I was panicked, because I had nothing. I had no movie, I had no effects. I had a big mess on my hands. When did you know it was working, that it was turning into a phenomenon with the public? It was, uh, and it wasn't really until it came out and it started, it was in the theaters. I was still, even the day it came out and Laddie called me, he says, it's a hit, it's a hit. You know, the first three performances sold out and it's gonna be giant. I said, look, all science fiction films do well in the first week. Wait until the third week and then let's see what happens. So I was always the pessimist. Star Wars has come out, a success, I think it's fair to say, beyond your expectations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. At what point did you receive a commitment or an urging to do a sequel? And, and, and did you immediately say yes, or, or was there any hesitation on your part to do it? Well, it didn't really happen that way, because what I did when I was writing it, I wrote one movie, and then I couldn't do the whole movie because it was way too big. The first draft was, you know, it had too much stuff in it, it was way too big, it couldn't possibly be done. So I took a deep breath and said, okay, I'm gonna have to take all these great ideas, I'm gonna, and that part I'm just gonna have to cut out, and I'll just do the, what it was then, really the first act, and I'll expand this and make this into a movie. So I did that, but then as a writer, you know, you create this whole thing, and it's, you know, sitting there on the shelf. Um, so as soon as the film was successful, there wasn't any question in my mind that I would immediately go on and do the rest of them so I could finish it. What to you is the biggest difference, overall difference, between film number one and film number two? Well, um, the biggest problem I was grappling with in film number two is the fact that it's the middle act of a three-act play. Now, some people find it a darker film than the first. It is a darker film because in the first act you introduce everybody, the second act, you put them in the worst possible position they can ever get into in their lives, and it's every, you know, and they're in a black hole, never able to get out. And in the third act, they get out. That's just, again, that's drama. That's the way it works. You don't have an exuberant, happy second act. What was the biggest technological advance between the making of one and the making of two? Well, there wasn't really too much of a technological... We, we refined what we had primarily, but there wasn't any giant technology. The major technological break was in one, and that was using... Um, you know, uh, motion control cameras and that sort of thing to allow the ships to be able to move freely and that sort of thing. That was the big advance. Everything after that was, um, we were able to do more stop motion. I was able to do a lot more things. They weren't really technological advances, but I was able to get a lot more into stop motion, which I couldn't do before. And, um, uh, you know, generally have uh, a bigger scope to things than I could do before. So if the first film was a, a, a technological, challenge to get ships to fly in space with a lot of that movement. The second one was to do a stop-motion movie. How did you choose or, or get together with Frank Oz to, to be Yoda? When I created Yoda, I said I want him to be really, really small, uh, but not, you know, six feet. I want him, you know, be about 18 inches, two feet high. And to do that, I said, well, what am I going to do? And how am I going to get a character? And what, you know, what am I going to do? Whenever I'm creating one of these films, I mean, I have my imagination. And if I were a novelist, I could just write it, and I wouldn't have to think about it. But I write it, and then I say, well, now, how am I going to do this? You know, how am I going to pull this off? And I decided to do it as a puppet. I thought that was the best. And so uh, I'd known Jim Henson, and I went to Jim and said, you know, do you want to do this? Because I really asked Jim to do it first and he said well I'm busy I'm doing this I'm doing that and I'm making a movie and all and I really can't but how about you know Frank you know Frank's the other half of me and everything and I said well that'd be fantastic it's an extraordinary creation I think it was exciting for everybody because it was the idea of taking and Jim was very interested in doing realistic characters you know that weren't really Muppets uh, and um, and so we, we all really worked together on it
Tell me about how you first met and, and worked with John Williams. I had known Steven Spielberg for a long time up to this point. And, uh, you know, I was, we were talking about the film real early on when I was writing the script. And I said, you know, I want, you know, I want a classical score. I, you know, I want the, you know, the, the uh, corn gold kind of feel about this thing. It's, a, it's an old fashioned kind of movie. And, and I want that grand uh, soundtrack that you used to have on movies. And he said, the guy you got to talk to is John Williams. You know, he did Jaws. I love him. He's the greatest composer ever lived. You got to talk to him. And so I did. I mean, it was really Stephen that introduced us and, and recommended him. And, um, you know, I talked to him and said, OK. And he said he was interested. So he, he did it. And he's a, a dream to work with. You know, it's the, he's a, a most wonderful collaborator. Didn't you at first want him to use existing classical music? Is that true? No, no. I had, I had written it to certain pieces of music. I write to music. So when I'm writing a scene, I, I have the music there, and I'm writing it to the music. And then, uh, in a lot of cases, we'll use that same music as a temp track. So there was temp tracks of classical music in the score. And, um, and with Johnny, you can say, look, I want something that feels exactly like this. You know, it just, you understand the emotion here and the emotion there and what's going on. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then he will take that and he will come up with his own composition and his own themes, which are uniquely, you know, Star Wars themes in this case. And, but he'll give it that same emotional thrust that was in the, in the classical piece. He knows exactly what I'm talking about and he's really conscientious in trying to get the director's vision uh, on the screen. What kind of feedback did you get? to that incredible climactic scene in Empire when we all learn who Darth Vader really is. I was nervous about it, but in the end, I didn't get much of a reaction out of it. I mean, people you know, were curious about whether it was true or not. And I purposely left it so that it would be ambiguous, so that uh, you wouldn't really know, and people would sort of debate it for the next week. Again, I had two more years or more to. Um, you know, I wanted people to sort of debate whether it's true or not true or like sort of thing. Well, George, as you know, people are just nuts for these movies. <laughs> and to learn so much about them and what went into them and what inspired you is, is a real treat. No, well, thank you. It's fun. I hope that people continue to enjoy the films because um, it's, it's nice to think of them as being timeless. By the time you got to episode three, did anything from public feedback or from your own second thoughts change your vision of what the third installment should be? Or is it the way you thought, thought it would always turn out? No, it's pretty much the way it was always thought to come out. I mean, the, I had to make certain changes of things because in the original screenplay, the, the Ewoks were Wookiees and, and Chewbacca really wasn't the co-pilot. So, um, and so when I did the first film, I love the Wookiee so much. I said, well, I got to get a Wookiee in here, even though, because those may never get done. So I took the Wookiee out of the battles and made him the co pilot. Uh, because originally they were sort of a primitive race of people who couldn't fly or couldn't do anything. And because uh, that was the whole point. And um, so I had to sort of, I had to figure out how I was going to do Wookiees. And I basically cut them in half and called them Ewoks. But it was, it was, um, you know, a lot of that stuff is all all there, but in the, in the original, it was a ground battle and an air battle all together. How did you ever think of Jabba the Hutt? Well, Jabba, it's one of those things I needed a, a gangster. I mean, I had the, he was in the first film, and uh, in, the, um, you know, in the special edition, we're, we're putting back a lot of material with Jabba the Hutt in the first film, in the, in the very first one you know, that we did. And um, he, so he was in that, you know, he's this big gangster. Uh, and um, it wasn't until a little later that we actually, because we couldn't do that sequence, because we didn't have the time. But uh, when we got to the third one and Jabba appeared, then we did this whole thing of designing. I wanted a big kind of repulsive character. And, uh, and uh, you know, we had a lot of designers coming up with various versions of Jabba the Hutt. Was it a conscious decision to move a good chunk of the action for part three into an earthly outdoor terrain? Uh, it's so different from anything you see in the first two films. Well, it was. I'm, I'm very conscious of the environments. And I try to have at least three environments in a movie, and I try to have them as different as possible. And then from movie to movie, I try to have the environments as different as possible. Um, you know, in the first movie, we were on a sand thing. It was all kind of a brown color. 
And so then on the second one, I put in the snow, and it was all kind of white. Uh, and then I did the green, you know, swampy kind of thing. Uh, and the third one, you know, I'm, you're sort of, I mean, what can you do in terms of environments? You have to shoot it somewhere on this earth. Unfortunately, we can't go somewhere else. So, you know, a forest was really about the only thing I had left. And originally, even with the Wookiees, they, they, the Wookiees lived in a forest environment. They lived in the same kind of tree houses, and they did that. You know, it was, they were sort of earth people. There's a whole motif of, like, Luke's planet. Every, everybody is brown. There's lots of browns and earth tones. Everything is earth tones and light tan and light brown, uh, flesh color. You know, it's all very uh, warm, warm tones. And then when you go to the Death Star, it's all black and white. Everything is black and white all the time. I mean, it's all very harsh and contrasty and black and white. And I use that a lot. And so in the larger arc, it was the same way. You know, it was, you know, where the Wookiees lived, it was all sort of green and brown. You know, I added that in. It sort of was a motif that went from you know, sort of a tan brown to a green brown. And uh, so that, that sort of still exists in the actual film. It's, uh, there's a whole color and environment motif that goes through, and the good guys are all the earth colors, and the bad guys are all colorless. <laughs> Your many, many fans, and there are many avid fans, as you know, of the Star Wars trilogy, are wondering about the next three films, and why is it taking so long, why does it take so long, and how long will it take? <laughs> well, um, I am I'm working on the, the next three films, and, and it's, it's uh, um, uh, I am in the process of writing the three screenplays now, and it takes a while to write... Uh, write the screenplays. It, uh, to write the first Star Wars took me about two years, so I'm writing three scripts at once. It won't take that long, but um, uh, it takes a long time to prep them, and uh, hopefully we'll have one finished uh, for 98. If not, it'll be 99, but um, the, um, we're doing all three at once. I'm writing all three at once, and the first three are based on the backstory that relates to where everybody came from, how they got there, uh, what their relationships are. Has this backstory been in your head all along for, from the inception? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I had to do the backstory in order to write the first three. Uh, I had to know where Darth Vader came from. I had to know what his relationship to Luke was. I had to know how Ben Kenobi figured in all of this. Um, you know, and I had to realize that there were, you know, I had to understand that there were twins. And the whole arc of the story uh, in, the, in the three that are out there now is really the redemption of. Anakin Skywalker. And so the first three are really, that I'm writing now, are really about Anakin Skywalker. So now you have a redemption of somebody that you don't really even know. He's just always in a black suit. But you don't know how he fell from grace and the, the trauma that went through to get him to there. And then his son brings him back. But it's, um, you know, and the real story hasn't even been told yet. What would it take to persuade you to go back onto a soundstage and direct a film yourself? Well, I'd like to direct again. I mean, I'm very interested um, and still in directing. And um, there is a possibility I may direct one of the next Star Wars. If I do direct again, it'll be the first one so that I can set the stage and, the, and you know, how everything works uh, for the other directors to follow. But as we approach the millennium, we can look forward to the, the prequel trilogy? Definitely.